Gate thus the sorceress kingdom fought there. Chapter 5, Know Your Enemy Calm Before the Storm. Written by Oblivion 2991. While his superiors chewed him out for nearly an hour, Itami had put on a mask of carefully feigned ignorance and let the words flow in one ear and out the other. In the end, the meeting, which felt more like an interrogation, had ended with a since you brought them back, it can't be helped. He had to report to Ichigaya, the Ministry of Defense, about how he had been protecting those refugees who were unable to care for themselves, such as the sick, injured, elderly, and the children. While the lecture was unavoidable, when Itami said that he had forced his way through for humanitarian reasons, the other side could only smile bitterly and acknowledge his efforts. Although, you'll have to take care of them, they said at the end. That didn't mean that Itami would have to pay for them out of his own pocket. But, he would be in charge of arranging the protection of the refugees. That was the condition placed on him. Itami thought about feeding the refugees and sleeping arrangements for them and left the black corridor for the staircase. If he put in a requisition with the ration team, he could probably solve the first problem. Granted, they would be eating combat rations, but they could hardly pick and choose. The real issue was arranging beds for them. The barracks on the base were not complete yet, and the team members had to make do with the frames of the buildings. Tents were the only way out. It would seem, preparing the documents, recording the required items, the chops, ah, what a pain, Itami thought as he stepped out into the corridor. As he continued walking, Itami saw someone sitting on a chair in the shadows. Along with that was a mote of light from a lit cigarette. The wisp of smoke which curled up to the ceiling came from a mouth that was curled up in a sly smile. It was First Lieutenant Yanagida. Itami, did you do it on purpose? Yanagida asked. Do what on purpose? Asked Itami. Yanagida was younger than him, but he had been a lieutenant longer than the freshly promoted Itami. When ranks were the same, seniority took precedence. On the other hand, Itami didn't like Yanagida at all. His principle was to involve himself as little as possible with people he didn't like. That way, it would reduce friction and smooth over unpleasant incidents in the other party's memory. Don't act dumb. Everyone knows it. You've never missed a single periodic check-in before, so who's going to believe you when you say comms are bad? Were you afraid of being ordered to abandon the refugees? Questioned Yanagida. Ah, well, about that. It's a different world, after all. It's hard to predict the condition of the ionosphere and the magnetosphere, right? Plus, there's probably sunspots here too. Aha ha Itami scratched his head while he laughed like an idiot. Felt bad, but he didn't particularly need to convince Yanagida. Even if no one believed him, the report still said, because of poor communications, I could not receive further instructions. So I made a judgment call and brought the refugees back to the base. Hmph. You're really trying to cover it up. Really? Noted Yanagida as he took a long drag on his cigarette and exhaled. Along with the smoke came a sigh. Eh, well, we had to deepen relations with the locals sooner or later anyway. This was just ahead of schedule. Even Top thinks of it that way too. But to us, well, it's a pain in the ass. Our plans are all in a mess now. Yanagida sounded kind of helpless as he said that. When he saw the state Yanagida was in, Itami couldn't help but feel guilty. You'll be spiritually rewarded for it, sooner or later. Assured Itami, Yanagida forcefully put out his cigarette in an ashtray and shrugged. That's not enough. It's nowhere near enough. Yanagid commented. Well, someone's petty today. What do you want me to do to cheer you up? Asked Itami. Yanagida smiled thinly, then rose. We'll talk about it elsewhere. Scene change. The JSDF base. The sun was slowly setting, and to the west, the sky turned red where the day would end. As they watched the sky, the two men at the clothes drying point of the west know. Two barracks, temporary, looked at each other. Yanagida leaned against the fence and lit a cigarette before speaking. Judging from the information we've collected earlier, this world is a gold mine. The DNA sequences of the creatures here are very similar to ours. For all we know, we could even breed with them. The exact theory is still in the hands of the scholars, but what I can tell you is that we can live in this world. We're breathing this world's air now, and although our food is imported from the other side of the gate, 
if the creatures here can eat it, then we should be able to eat theirs with no difficulty. This world's environment has not been destroyed or polluted. There's a lot of lands, and its plants are lush and vibrant. And those elements which would be considered rare earth back in our world are abundant here. The civilization level of the locals is as far from us as an ant would be from an elephant, which is an overwhelming advantage for us. This world has only opened its gates to Japan. This is either good fortune or a disaster in the making. Investments in Japan's resource entrepreneurship are going through the roof in the New York, Shanghai and London stock exchanges. Oil and or related stocks are going down. Nagata Cho's MPs are in consultation with the Economic Federation people day and night. The diplomatic services are going crazy trying to handle the NATO countries. However, the government, the most critical part of this whole business, is having trouble dealing with it. China, Germany, and the other resource-providing nations are starting to demand the special region should be internationally controlled. The problem of whaling can be explained away by being our country's culture, so even if the whole world looks down on us, it's fine, but when it comes to the economy, our country still isn't strong enough to make enemies of half the world. Began Yanagida's long-winded explanation. So, I'm telling you, Itami, this is what Nagata's people want to know. They want to know what this world has that is worth antagonizing half the world for. Finished Yanagida. And if there is such a thing? Itami asked. Obviously someone who possesses something is stronger than someone who doesn't, you should know that. The People's Liberation Army massacred many Tibetans and Uyghurs, China's poisoning of frozen gyoza, the Russians unilaterally tearing up the natural gas mining agreement because they're wealthy, South Ossetia seceding from Georgia. In the end, all of these people managed to do what they did because they had resources which everyone wanted. You could even say that if we could gain something from the special region which was worth antagonizing the whole world, we might resort to any means necessary to secure it. Yanagida said. Itami shrugged. Yanagida, I didn't know you were thinking so much about our country. At least now I know you're a patriot. However, people have many uses. In truth, I'm not really interested in all this geopolitical stuff. See, what I'm thinking about now is how the children I brought back are going to eat and sleep. So, what exactly do politics have to do with my job? Didn't I tell you? They want to know what value this place has. No, that's not right, they want to know where the valuable things are. Whether the special region belongs to Japan or it's managed by the international community, anyone with that information will have an overwhelming advantage. You do know that you're in the best position to gain this information, right? All the other recon teams did check out what the villages were selling and add a few new words to our vocabulary. What you did was gain the trust of the people here. As long as you're around, we can find out where they build things, where they hide things, how to communicate with them, and so on. Repeated the first lieutenant. Hang on, Yanagida. Do you expect me to ask the kids where the treasure is buried? Where are the oil fields? Do you think they'll tell me if I just ask them? I'm sorry to say this, but I suck at geography, even though I went through university. Do you think these uneducated children will do any better? I can tell you right now that they won't know anything that doesn't concern their immediate daily lives. As he said this, Itami thought about the silver-haired girl with a wagon full of books and the old man that was her master. It would probably be more productive to let the linguists go through their books. Finding people with information and obtaining that information is absolutely critical. Yanagida said. After hearing this, Itami could not go on. Itami, as of late, you've been allowed a lot of freedom in your activities. Your next mission is going to depend heavily on how well the officers can write, but regardless of what your orders contain, your final objective remains the same. Damn it! I'm tired of this shit. Itami continued cursing bitterly. Humph! Well, you were happily spending taxpayers' money up till now, so how can you say, Oh, I don't like it, I don't want it? Better work hard. You know, Itami. We made an interesting discovery not long before you and the refugees arrived back to the base. And I am sure it will change your attitude towards the things here," said Yanagida. And what is that interesting discovery what are you speaking about? Shrugged Itami in an annoyed tone. Yanagida tossed his cigarette but away after he exhaled the smoke. We are not the only players here. What do you mean by that? Inquired Itami. Our early flight reconnaissance discovered another gate 10 miles away from our position, revealed Yanagida. 
And? said Itami uncaringly. Yanagita glared at him. Not long after the jets entered the airspace of the other players, they have been chased away by the fucking angel-looking creatures who's used energy weapons. Do you understand? Energy weapons. Think about it. What will happen when a civilization who can construct energy weapons and most likely capable of space travel attack our civilization? What will happen to the Earth if they manage to locate our planet? The pilots only managed to escape because those who occupied the other gate allowed them. Think Itami, and consider the situation. It is worth to laze around while who knows when the other civilization attacks us? Itami gulped then thought about a moment. Do you have any proof? Yanagita sighed. If you don't believe me, ask Lieutenant General Hazama to show you the pictures what the pilots took from the creatures or ask the pilots to show you their F-2 jets with full of holes. After that, you will realize, we are not the biggest fish here. Itami gulped. Yanagita turned around and left Itami with his thoughts. Although he could not see what the future would bring, practically speaking, he had to handle this carefully. Since the whole situation was a mess, Proceeding without a plan would be counterproductive. Even so, the people who lived in these conditions were probably used to it. In any case, he had to get them something to eat and had to start pitching tents for the refugees to sleep in, as well as take the wounded to the doctors, then distribute clothing. They also needed more information from the other civilization. The seniors or the older children could take care of the younger children. After a few days of these, in any case, Itami could probably relax a little. Living in tents was not going to be a long-term arrangement, especially since the people who would do so were children and old people. They would obviously want strong walls and a roof over their heads. After listening to Kiraka and Kurabayashi's suggestions, Itami was currently about two kilometers away from the south of Arnis Hill. They were building a campsite for the Kota village refugees in the patch of forest located there. For convenience's sake, they should build the camp closer to the hill, but that ran the risk of involving them in any firefights that occurred, so after studying the local terrain and conditions, they picked this place. Building the place was the job of the engineers, but it was up to Itami to provide resources, expendables, schematics, blueprints, and so on. MSGT Nishina was experienced with this sort of thing and had provided a lot of useful feedback. Though he got frustrated by Yanagita's nitpicky obsession with details, down to pointing out punctuation errors, in the end, he managed to obtain a computer from his superiors to help with his problems, and he spent the whole of the second day sleeping. If it were a government bureaucrat doing this, he'd have finished it with one hand. After hearing MSG Nishina's words, Itami gave thanks that he had never entered civil service. Well, I'm a public servant too, but because of special duties, we're hardly related anymore. Ah, I'm lucky to be a public servant on special duties. Sometimes he would mumble these words, and sometimes he would shout them. Preparing for a task was very troublesome. But once a mission started, the JSDF worked fast. In the blink of an eye, they clear-cut a stretch of trees, and after moving the ground with heavy equipment, they easily built a set of roofed houses. Lele could only watch this scene with her mouth open and her tongue tied. Well, it looks like we can unload our luggage at last. I need my sleep. Her master said with a yawn. Having resigned himself with these words, he vanished back into his tent. After watching her master, Lele could not help but agree with him. Horses did not draw their carriages, but they ran faster than horses. Their magic staffs could kill a flame dragon. Their sturdy, vast fortress at Arnis Hill. Their gigantic iron dragonflies soared through the sky while making terrible noises. The way they could instantly turn huge trees into planks, where even a team of woodchoppers would take half a day just to fell a single tree. Their carriages with giant shovels that could do the work of a hundred men in a flash. And then, there was the way they built houses in moments. Beside the strange carriages, there were the two strange armored adventurers. The black-clad warrior stood beside the gray armored one and inspected the carriages from afar while he held a blueprint in his hand. While his companion used her strange magic to literally rip out multiple kinds of wood from the earth, then used the materials what placed beside her and started to build the buildings. First, the soldiers of JSDF insisted they stay away because it is not safe to stand in the middle of the construction site. But she insisted on helping them and giving her some material and blueprints. 
so she can build too, as she said. I quote, I am engineer, trust me. I want to play puzzle too. The soldiers have been fully frightened by her insisting tone and for the advice of the black-clad warrior. She is like a child. Just gave her what she wants. Trust me, she will never give up until she gets what she wants. And thus, the construction workers simply sighed and gave her what she requested. And for their surprise, by a mere glance of the blueprints, she was able to completely replicate the building method with a more efficient and faster way with her telekinesis. Lele was growing jaded to these surprises. The children and elderly who knew nothing had been shocked into silence. They gave thanks in earnest and sincerely accepted these benefits. As for Lele, who was wiser but still could not make sense of these unreal circumstances, her brain had long since overheated. The elf girl, Tuka, had decided to walk up beside her at that moment. Papa will be disappointed that he missed seeing something like this. I have to tell him later, she said. The elf girl's body had recovered quickly, and she was dressed in the clothes that the people here had given her, which were a shirt and pants made of a stretchy, yet soft material, which she later found out were called T-shirt and jeans. She watched the proceedings silently. Lele was envious. She couldn't bear to watch anymore. All she wanted to do was curl up under her blankets. Well, she had already forgotten that she was supposed to be a guardian of the forest and watched in mute surprise. However, since she had chosen the path of the sage, she could not leave these difficult to explain circumstances as they were. After all, a sage's ambition was to conquer the mysteries of the world with wisdom. After properly motivating herself, she set forth. As she got close to the moving iron-skinned carriages, the workers there looked at her with a mix of surprise and fear. They seemed to be shouting something along the lines of, It's dangerous. If she were run over by such a large vehicle, she would probably be squashed into a paste. Because of that, they were probably trying to keep her away. Just then, a vehicle puffing plumes of smoke rolled up from the corner of the construction site. Lele proceeded to study its structure carefully. She understood with a single glance. She thought about what the man had said to her with a smile as she stood in front of it. Please wait a while, we'll be done soon. Sadly, Lele could not understand his good intentions. Lele could tell that they were trying to learn the local language. They repeated their words and were eagerly trying to talk to her. While the results were not very evident, at the very least they could communicate. However, if Lele waited until they learned how to speak the local language, she would not be able to learn anything. She wanted to know about the tools and technology they used, as well as what they thought about. To do that, she would have to learn their language. Thus, Lele steeled herself and began speaking to the man. Then she felt as someone placed his hand on her shoulder. The workers said, it is dangerous here. The one who spoke to her was the black-clad warrior, Mamen. After he warned her, immediately returned to his companion side. To her disappointment, the men in green did not allow her to get closer to the metal carriages. She strolled toward the two adventurers and quietly inspected what the armored woman is doing. With raid in each motion a tree has been twisted out from its place meanwhile with her other hand she constructed another house. It was like she is conducting sonnets. What kind of magic is that? inquired the blue-haired mage. Mamen and Raiden looked at her for a moment. This is not really a magic. I just manipulate the data content of the world around me," explained Raiden. Lele tilted her head. Not magic. Raiden shook her head. No, I am not really a magic caster. Of course, I know a few spells and I am capable of using magic. But this is just one of my esper power. Telekinesis. What is an esper? Asked Lele curiously. The esper word refer to the extraordinary perception. An esper is a person who is capable manipulate the data content of the world around him or her, inserting new variables of the equation of reality, changing it, shaping to its own will, explained Raiden. Lele nodded. What's the difference between your abilities and magic? Raiden continued. A normal magic user use their spiritual powers as many people calls it mana to channel it to themselves or the environment. They use it to change and bend it to the magic user's will. Magic casters use this spiritual energy to shape the world around them. Meanwhile, 
espers use their brain computing capabilities to shape the data content of the world around them. As how much you can shape the world around you, that depend on the user brain computing capacity. Is there a way to become Esper? Asked Lele curiously. Regretfully not. The people had to born with this ability. Replied Raiden. Bullshit. You just need to pick up the job class. But she doesn't have to know that. She rolled her eyes under her hood. Suddenly the three of them heard clapping sound behind their backs. Mamon and Lele glanced back meanwhile Raiden concentrated on her work. The man who clapped was a tall, eyeglass-wearing man who wore a military uniform. Impressive, he said with a grin on his face. I keep trying. Hopefully, I can finish before the sun settles, explained Raiden as she twisted out another tree and placed the huge log upon the big sack of trunks. I hope it is not a problem, but I overheard your conversation with the little lady. The man said, Nah, we knew you were here all along. Right, Maman San? Answered Raiden. Maman simply nodded. In our profession, you had to be aware your environment, or you will die at young age. Explained the girl. Yanagida nodded. I see. By the way, I am Akira Yanagida, first lieutenant in the JSDF. He held out his hand towards Maman who shook it. I am Maman. He introduced himself. And she is Raiden, my traveling companion. Yo! I can't shake hands right now. As you see, my hands are full, replied Raiden cheerfully. And she is Lele. Maman motioned to the blue-haired mage. Yanagida nodded to her. The sage in training nodded back. It is strange you two could speak our language perfectly. Yanagida noted. Translator items, explained Maman. Yanagida smiled. I see. And how do these translator items works exactly? He turned his gaze towards the adventurers. It would take a few days only to explain the basic foundation of the magic system, those who never used it or learned it before. Explained Raiden. I see. That means the magic can be learned. Yanagida summarized. Who knows? Maybe yes. Perhaps no, Mr. Yanagida. Information is a precious resource after all. You can't give it away without the adequate payment. Raiden teased him. Yanagida just smiled sinisterly. Ah, I almost forget why I am here. I am here to ask you two to come with me. Lieutenant General Hazama wishes to speak with the two of you. Why do he wish to speak with us? Asked Maman suspiciously. Shrugging, Yanagida replied. I am merely the messenger, but it would be the best if you can come with me immediately. Raiden glanced to Maman who simply nodded. She sighed. Fine. I'll finish this house and we will go." Yanagida nodded with a satisfied expression. When you finished here, please come to the nearby guard post. I will be waiting for you there. And with that, he left. Message? Be aware of him. I feel he is suspicious about us, said Maman. Message? You don't have to tell me twice. He gave off the feeling when I speak with Demiurge. The chill ran down my spine from that guy. Message? Indeed, nodded Maman in agreement. I spotted a few of our eight-edged assassins around the base. Do you recognize them? Message. Yes, strange. I don't remember to the left behind such order for the kit. Message. Hmm, maybe it was Demiurge who gave the order. You know he often acts on his own when he thinks this is all part of my plan. Said Mamanga in the message. Message. Yeah, right. He is annoying when he do that, noted Raiden. Message. We need to contact with the assassin units around the base and ask them about it. Raiden I finished with the house. Well, this is for today. Sorry, Lele san But it seems we have to take care of some business. Talk to you later. She smiled to Lele cheerfully as she waved goodbye to her. Maman only nodded to her and left. Lele nodded, and the two adventurers left her with her thoughts. She had so many unanswered questions. She needed to note them before she forgets them. The two adventurers met Yanagida at the guard post. He turned his glance towards them. Are you ready? The two adventurers simply nodded and sat in the LAV that was already waiting for them. After approximately 15 minutes later, the three arrived before Hazama's office door. Yanagida raised his hand and gently knocked on it. 
A moment later, all three of them heard a distinctly male voice from the office. Come in. Yanagida opened the door, and the three of them entered. Behind his desk sat Lieutenant General Hazama, who currently inspected the reports. He looked up from the papers. Ah, so, you two are finally here. He stood up from his chair, and the cheap office furniture creaked under his weight. I am Lieutenant General Hazama, the commander of this base. Mamen and Raiden stepped closer and shook the man's hand. I am Mamen, and she is Raiden. Mamen introduced themselves. Please take a seat. Hazama motioned the seats near them. Raiden looked to the dark warrior who nodded to her approvingly. The two of them took the seats. We thank you for your generosity, Lieutenant General. May I ask why you called us here? Inquired Mamen. Straight to the subject. I see you are the man of the action. Not the words Mamen Dano. Hazama commented. Mamen remained silent. I called you two here because I have a few questions about the events connected to the dragon. The reports what I got from the events is quite foggy, and I need another perspective to strengthen the reports. Explained the general. Ask away, said Mamen. Hazama considered his first question. According to First Lieutenant Atami report, you Mamandano used your weapons to severe the dragon's head from its body with a single strike. You severed the creature's head with a single blow that according to the First Lieutenant, could only be damaged when leading Private Katsumoto used his armor-piercing weapon. Please answer me honestly. You two are a threat to the people around you. The two of them looked at each other. We have no ill intentions. If our presence here is undesired, we will leave immediately, answered Maman honestly. That's not necessary. You saved the villagers and most likely the lives of our soldiers from that creature. You are guests here, Azama assured. Thank you. We appreciate it. Raiden bowed her head. Hazama nodded skeptically. Let's continue. My second question. What entails the job of the adventurer? I am sorry, but I never heard of this kind of job description besides fantasy novels and stories. Maman looked at Raiden. Raiden answered to Hazama. Hmm. Imagine us like mercenaries who delve in ruins, explore unknown areas and exterminate monsters for the right price. Hazama lowered his head. I see. You two are mercenaries then. No. We are adventurers. We do not participate in wars and do not choose sides in the war. We are completely neutral. However, there are cases when adventurers contract with the military of the kingdom for exploration purposes. Maman cleared. Hazama nodded. That's leading me to my third question. Which kingdom are you coming from? According to the first lieutenant report, you came here to explore these lands. That's correct. Our contractor hired us to explore these lands. We came from the Sorcerer Kingdom, answered Maman. Sorcerer Kingdom? Interesting name for a country. Where is this Sorcerer Kingdom? If you don't mind me asking, asked Hazama suspiciously. Very far away. We are sorry, but our contract states we can't give away our country location without clearance, said Maman. Hazama nodded. I understand. It is strange for you to speak our language so well. How is that? You seem uninterested in our machines while the refugees are watching them like they were some miracle of the gods. As we stated before, we use translator items what makes us unable to understand every language and writings. Please don't ask how it works exactly, Hazamadano, because it would take days to explain the foundation of the magic behind the enchantment. As for why we are so calm in the presence of your machines and unknown soldiers. It is easy, we see weird things every day, and we know how those metal things work in a basic way. And from the smell that they are emitting, the machines use some kind of fossil fuel. Correct, answered Raiden. Azama nodded. Correct. You have excellent observation skills, Raiden Dano. I try my best, she answered cheerfully. Back to the topic. Seems you know how magic really works, and you have a basic education in science. Fascinating. Could you share the information with us? I assure you, it would be a benefit for both sides. Hazama said hopefully. As we said before, we need clearance from our superiors to do that. Please understand Hazama Dano. Information is a precious resource, said Maman. 
Hazama sighed in disappointment. What a pity. But, back to the questions. The two adventurers looked each other and nodded. Raiden Dano, according to the report of First Lieutenant Atami, you stood in the dragon's mouth and survived its flames that completely scorched the surrounding and held back the dragon only with your hands. How is that possible? Your armor seems pretty futuristic and well-made. Compared to the ones we had seen since we arrived there. Our armor made of adamantine alloy. The alloy is heat removal and its resistance are one of the best in the kingdom. And why her armor looks like that? I don't understand the concept futuristic. Maybe because the translator item does not work as intended. But her armor is an artifact armor that she found when we delved in some ruins, and thanks to her unique abilities, she could equip it and use it. Answered Mammon. I see. I assume you can't give us a sample from your armors for further analyzation. Hazama said. Mammon shook his head. Maybe you should ask the higher-ups. We are only here to explore the area. Hazama was dissatisfied after he saw the Dark Warrior response. But he does not show it on the outside. I understand. My last question is. The tension raised in the air as Hazama took out a map from the drawer of his desk. He showed the pictures of the armored angel looking creatures to the two adventurers. Do you recognize this creature? He asked suspiciously. Raiden and Mammon inspected the picture. Where did you take this picture? Asked Raiden. Our early flight survey took the pictures. We have a nasty encounter with the creatures. Answered Hazama. Message. Do you know any mental information about this? Why didn't you warn me? Mamanga asked in a nervous tone. Then a green aura surrounded him because his emotion suppression kicked in. Message. I don't have memories about invaders in our flight space. I have so many summon. I can't watch out every single one of them. Of course you can. Don't you, Emperor Palpatine? Message. Sorry, I just lost my head for a moment. You are right. Sometimes even I lose the count of how many we have already summoned. Message. Sigh. No, I am the one who should be sorry for my sudden outburst. What do you think? Do we answer his question honestly? Message. We need to answer his question carefully, as foggy as possible. This Hazama and the glass-wearing man are suspicious enough already. But considering he already suspects us, I think we need to reveal a little information to him. Just to lessen their suspicions. Message. Right? Answered Raiden. The two adventurers looked to Hazama. These are Nephilim guards. Answered Raiden. Nephilim guards? So, you know them. What kind of creatures are they? Hazama asked suspiciously. They are hybrids, answered Mammon. Hybrids, asked Hazama. Part angel, part demon, answered Raiden. I see, you two encountered them before. Allow me to ask, but which kingdom use angels and demons as soldiers? Mammon nodded. They are part of the army of the kingdom where we came from. Angels and demons are not the only race in the military of the sorcerer kingdom. I see, what do you think? Why did the creatures attack our flying machines? Inquired Hazama carefully. Hazama Dano, you said your men took the pictures under flight survey. Did they fly above a fortress? Inquired Raiden. Hazama nodded uneasily. Then you have your answer. The creatures are very territorial. They protect their territory at all cost. Of course, first, they always warn the victims and try to chase them away. Explained Raiden. At least, this was the last command that I gave them. She rolled her mental eyes. Thank you for your honest answers. May you allow me to ask? You two are from another world like us. Hazama asked. Raiden smiled. You are a sharp man, Hazama Dano. Yes, we are from the other side of our gate. Nodding, Hazama said. I see. I hope our little airspace violation does not cause any international problem between our nations in the future. That depends on the politicians. If it depends on us, we are against the war and we would appreciate our identities remain safe in your hand. We are only here to explore after all, answered Mammon. Azama smiled. I am glad you see it my way. Your secret is safe with me for the time being. I assure you, my reports have only been read by the higher-ups. 
Raiden and Mama nodded. Hazama closed the map and put it away. Thank you for your time. I hope we can speak in the future. The three of them stood up and shook hands. They turned their heads in the direction of the knocking sound. Come in. The man entered through the door. It was Atami, Lieutenant General Hazama. You sent for me? He saluted. Then he recognized Raiden and Mamen. Oh, hello guys. What are you doing here? Yo, Itami Kuin. We just finished our discussion with Hazama Dano, answered Raiden. We need to have a short discussion with the first lieutenant. After that, he will escort you two to your appointed quarters. Please wait patiently before the door, instructed Hazama. That will be not necessary. We used to camp under the night sky, protested Mamen. I insist. You two are our guests here. I would be a horrible host if I would not ensure your well-being. Hazama said. Then we accept it. Thank you. The two adventurers bowed their head and left Hazama and Itami to speak. After they had closed the door, Itami and Hazama started to discuss things. A few minutes later Itami came out from the lieutenant general office with a tied look. So, the lieutenant general gave me the task to show you around the camp and lead you to your quarters. Please take care of us. Maman lowered his head. Please follow me then. With that, the trio started the trip around the base. Under their tour, Itami bombed them with his questions that the two adventurers, although just a little bit, found amusingly annoying. Questions such as, How many monsters you two killed? Which was the biggest one? Do you meet sexy animal maids under your adventures? Do you have any good novels where you came from? Etc. The bombardment of questions mentally completely exhausted the two adventurers. But suddenly they met Mari Kurokawa. Oh, you here. I looked everywhere for the two of you. Come. According to the doctor, you two did not participate in the medical examination. Sergeant First Class Kurokawa. I am in the middle of showing them around in the base. Could it wait a little longer? Itami said. Did you show them our medical wings? First Lieutenant? Inquired Kurokawa. Not really. He scratched the back of his head nervously. Then, our next stop will be the medical wings of our encampment. Come, Kurokawa demanded. But, no buts, first lieutenant. I have orders to take them to medical investigation. Itami sighed in defeat. Fine, sorry guys. He looked at them with the eyes of regret. Raiden sighed. It is really necessary? I have dreadful experience with doctors. Kurokawa nodded. Absolutely. Raiden looked to Mamen who said, Get over with it. The woman shrugged. Arg. Fine. The four of them walked over to the medical wing and took of their armor so Kurokawa and the base doctor could examine them properly. Everything went fine until... Mamen just sat in the waiting room while read some magazines that the staff placed in the chamber when he heard vicious screams from the surgery room. A needly... Stay away from me. Raiden screamed as she ran out from the room half-naked and darted behind Mamen. Mamen Kuin, save me from that fiendish thing. Raiden begged. Itami jumped up from his seat because of his surprise. Mamen sighed and looked at his friend. What happened this time? Raiden pointed to Kurokawa. She wanted to give me an injection. An injection. With a needle. Mari Kurokawa tilted her head as she walked out from the surgery room. I just wanted to take some blood sample. I never saw such intense reactions from my patients. Please excuse her. She is just a little afraid of needles. She had bad memories with them. Explained Mamen. Mari nodded. I see. Does she need a therapist? We have a good one in the base. Raiden took a deep breath and stopped trembling. I am fine. Jay, just please keep me away from those fiendish things. I gave enough blood for multiple lives. I understand. Then, I will not force you to give a blood sample. Kurokawa said. Raiden nodded. Thank you. With that, the examination continued. Itami leaned closer to Mamen. Does she really fear needles that much? Mamen sighed in disappointment. Yes, don't ask her why. It only brings back painful memories. Itami nodded in understanding then started to mumble under his nose. She is not afraid to jump in a monster mouth, but she is afraid of a needle, he sighed. Well, 
Everybody has their fears after all. The examination soon ended and thanks to the high-level concealment illusion that concealed their presence. The doctors found nothing suspicious. Itami continued the trip around the base. It took approximately one more hour. The three of them arrived at the freshly built house in the refugee camp. This is it for now, guys. I hope you liked our base. Maman motioned with his head. Yes, it was refreshing. I leave you two alone then. He turned around, then suddenly stopped. Oh, I almost forgot. Lieutenant General Hazama tasked me to ask you to come with us to the nearby agricultural town tomorrow. Of course, only if you want. What do you say, boss? Raiden looked to Maman. We accept the offer, answered the dark warrior. Thanks, guys. You just made my job a lot easier. He smiled. Good night. He turned around and left the two adventurers. Then he turned around again. One more last thing. Due to our lack of buildings, Raiden Kuin had to share the room with Rory, Tuka, and Lele. I hope it will be not a problem. Why we can't be accommodated together? inquired Maman. I don't know. Hazama only said it is not a good idea to put a man in a room with four women, replied Itami. Is that so? Maman nodded and looked to Raiden. Raiden laughed. He is a big boy. I am sure he will find a way to have some fun by himself. Mamanga became completely embarrassed hearing what his companion said, but his passive emotion suppression immediately kicked in. It will be all right, he noted. Come with me, Maman Kuin. I show you where you will be accommodated, Itami said. Raiden waved them as they left. Be a good boy, Maman Kuin. Don't forget to look under your bed before you go sleeping, she teased Maman. As Itami and Maman moved away from the house, Itami asked, Are you two together? No, we are only friends. Why do you ask? Maman looked to Itami. I mean, you two acted like you were a couple explained Itami. Hazama told me to keep my eye on them, but he and Raiden seems nice. Of course, I know the spies always seems nice at first, but still, they don't seem to be spies. Huh, why do I have to endure this? Why I can't just lay at home in my bed while I was reading one of my light novels or go to the anime convention? Thought Itami. Is that so? Maman thought back the few nights when the two of them tried together but a chill ran down his spine immediately. It was so embarrassing. Even now the thought of it made his emotion suppression trigger. It was not long after that when he became capable of getting a flesh and blood body for a short period. Under their 1000 year absence, Itami nodded. Despite her age, she is like a child. She needs constant supervision. Her mind is a little unstable, explained Maman. Why is that? I mean, she seems very capable. And how old is she anyway? Inquired the first lieutenant. I do not wish speak about her painful past or age without her permission. If she wants to share with anyone, she will share it. Maman said firmly. Itami lowered his head. I understand. Sorry. Maman only nodded in response. Soon the two of them reached Maman's quarters. Maman shared his quarter with Lele Master. Kato and two more men. Back in Raiden quarters, she entered her room. The room was empty. It had four neatly made beds. Drawers stood arranged in the four corners of the room. There was no electricity, nor water wired into the room. The JSDF most likely suspected the denizens of this world do not have that kind of luxury, and the JSDF seemingly did not tire themselves with the installation of those things. There were only four electrical lanterns and a guide how to use them placed beside them. The guide was translated into the language of the special region, so the resident of the room could read it. She looked around in the room with heightened her perception to make sure no one was spying on her. She closed the door behind her and activated her item what made others virtually impossible to spy on her. Time stop! She cast her magic, and the time stopped moving around her. She looked into the furthest corner of the room. You can come out now. From the corner, slowly a young-looking man appeared. He wore butler uniform and white butler gloves. He stepped forward and kneeled down. Creator Sama, it is good to see you. Likewise, Zero-san, how have you been? I hope you ate regularly, said Isdeth playfully. I am. 
thank you for your concern about your servant. But it is not necessary. Zero bowed his head in submission. Well, it does not hurt if you ask. By the way, how do you know who I am? Asked Raiden. You and Ain Sama used the same disguise 200 years ago with minimal changes. Explained Zero. It was not a good idea after all. I hoped we could play our hide and seek a longer time before our cover was blown. Raiden puffed her cheeks in a dissatisfied manner. No, the idea was splendid, Creator Sama. No one besides the denizens of Nazareth knows your adventurer appearance. We made sure the history books had no perfect description of your adventurer persona. Raiden sighed in relief. What a relief. Luckily, these two old bones have such capable servants. She said as Raiden patted her creation head, who smiled in satisfaction. It was like his god gave her blessing personally to his existence, and he was overjoyed. We live to serve Esteth Sama. He looked up to her creator. I assume Demiurge sent you there, Raiden said. No, I take the courage to investigate the enemy base with my assassin squad. Only after I become convinced, I reported Demiurge Sama. Zero replied. I see. Do you report our site to Demiurge or anyone else? No, not yet. I assumed you and Ain Sama have reasons to not tell it to his servants. Zero handed his written report to his death. She inspected it. Raiden nodded. Great work. You deserve a praise and a raise. She showed him the thumbs up playfully. Thank you, Creator Sama. He lowered his head. What mission has Demiurge entrusted you? Inquired Raiden. He entrusted my squad and me mostly with intelligence and technology collecting and Bobby trapping the base with various traps. So, if the situation requires, we can crush these inferior meat bags from inside out. Crafty, but do not underestimate them however inferior they seem to be. Be cautious and sharp. Don't let them discover you and only take technology that does not make them suspicious. If it requires, fake their registry. Are you able to hack into their system or not? Raiden asked. Zero nodded. Being an automaton NPC and because Isteth in her previous life was a program engineer who embedded into him the necessary protocols. He was able to do such things. Yes, Creator Sama. Their inferior technology is not able to stop me. Their technology is inferior. However, we can't let ourselves to be ignorant. We can't let them have the edge even for a moment. Do we? No, Isteth Sama. You can go now. Please do not report our discovery either to Demiurge San or anyone else. It would greatly hinder our work here. I understand. He nodded and stood up. Before he could go away, his creator stepped closer and hugged him. His eyes widened and sniffed deeply his creator's hair. He forever stores up this moment in his mental banks. The moment when his creator showed her love towards him. The worthless, inferior creation. Take care, Zero-san. Make me proud. He closed his eye. I will. Don't worry, Creator-sama. She let him go, and Zero disappeared. His death dispelled his time stop, and the time started to flow normally again around her. She hopped down one of the bed and begun to read the report. After she finished with it, she sent the mental information about it towards Mamanga. Message. Mamanga-san, I have some interesting information for you. Are you interested? Message. Send them. With that, Raiden sent the information package through their mental link. Message. Hmm. Interesting. Send a message. To Zero to meet me later in the night. Message. As you wish, Guild Master. One more thing. Message. Yes. Message. I managed to capture their Wi-Fi signal. We can play games. KHM. I mean, we can collect information from their network. Do you still have that haptic interfaced holographic DNA computer what I gave you? Do you? Message. I have it. It is somewhere in my inventory. Message. The SSID is JSDF and the password. Hackm 3 y 2 and 4 b 5 t 6 p 2 Well, and they still use WPA2 plus AES security protocols. You don't know how easily it can be hackable with my tech. Just make sure no one see you when you play or searching the internet. 
Our security and shielding protocols are easily able to shield us from the detection and cover our digital footprints in the network, but still be careful. You know, if someone sees you use the holographic DNA computer, you need to change the person memories. Message, I am aware of that. Message, have fun Mamanga-san. Be gingerly with the porn in the network. She chuckled. Message, not everyone is as perverted as you are. Good night, mom and out. With that, Mamanga terminated the contract. A half hours later, Rory, Tuka, and Lele entered the room, where Raiden did a few vertical one-handed push-ups. Hey! She greeted them while continued her one-handed push-ups. It seems we will be roommates. Then she became aware the three girls held bags in their hands. Oh, what are in those bags? Inquired Raiden. Wyvern scales, answered Lele blandly. I ah, uh, I see. If you don't mind, I have already reserved one of the beds. She pointed to her bed. Rory immediately took the closest bed. Lele and the still shy Tuka took the other two. Scene change. City of Italica. Italica City was founded 200 years ago by gathering merchants in the region to construct a fortress town. Politically speaking, this place was the crossroad of the Drescia and Appian highways and developed as a border town between the nations. But with the expansion of the empire's borders, its political importance had declined significantly, and it was just a mid-sized local market now. It doesn't have any local specialties, but the crops, livestock, and handmade products such as cloth would be sent to the capital, so it served as a collection base. Right now, this was the territory of the empire's noble family, the clan of Count Formal. Colt, the head of Clan Formal had three daughters, El, Louis, and Mui. Aside from the youngest Mui, the other two had been married off to other clans. Colt was planning to find someone to marry into the clan after his youngest grew up to take over the family estate. Mui was still single, and after Colt and his wife died because of an accident, misfortune started to befall the city. The eldest daughter El and the second daughter Louis married into the Count Rhone clan and the Count Misna clan respectively so Mui had the right of succession over them. This was the law of the empire, and there were no grounds for them to dispute. However, the youngest Mui was only 11, so whoever became her guardian would become the de facto leader. And so, the power struggle began. The talks between the two elder sisters started as a calm discussion and quickly turned into ugly quarrels, pulling the other's hair in scuffles, and even went so far as involving their husbands. The soldiers of Count Roan and Count Misna fought a small-scale war as a result. But their struggle did not escalate further. They had limited forces after all, and the husbands weren't blind with rage like their wives were. The security within the territory was maintained by the vassals of Count Formal and the soldiers of Count Roan and Count Misna. So there wasn't any threat to the livelihood of the merchants and residents. The value of Italica lay with its trade, there would be nothing to gain if it was laid to waste. And so, the situation became a stalemate. The dispute of the sisters shifted into the courts of the capital, and Mui's guardian would soon be decided by the deliberation of the emperor. However, the situation worsened after the empire's campaign against the other world. The heads of the Roan and Misna clans died in battle at the gate. With their husbands dead, El and Louise couldn't spare the effort to take care of the formal territory anymore and withdrew their forces, leaving Mui with the vassals of Count Formal. The young Mui couldn't control her vassals, and the running of the territory became ineffective from neglect. There weren't many loyal vassals left, but there were plenty who had ulterior motives. Before she realized it, corruption and injustice were running rampant. The citizens were wary, and security deteriorated. Loose bands of soldiers turned to banditry and started attacking caravans, grinding trade to a halt and stagnating the movement of resources. Bandits and trolls formed a group together and numbered in the hundreds. Finally, Italica City itself was attacked. Standing at the city gate, Pina let loose a few arrows at the retreating bandits and took a deep breath. She took a moment to look at the battlefield. Wounded soldiers staggered around or collapsed from blood loss. Arrows were shot into the stone walls, and the surrounding area was a mess. She spotted several citizens holding farm tools and sticks with a glance. Outside the wall, 
the corpses of bandits and carcasses of horses were scattered all over the ground. Norma, Hamilton, are you all right? Inside the broken gate, Norma was defending a barricade. He supported his body by putting his weight on a sword, his shoulders rising and down as he panted. He lifted a hand to signal that he was well, but his armor was covered with arrows and signs of being hit by a sword. His surroundings showed evidence of an intense battle, with bodies from the attacking bandits and defending soldiers everywhere. As for Hamilton, she was already sitting on the ground. Her legs were straightened with her palms supporting her body, barely keeping herself from keeling over. Her grip on her sword was loose. I am, ha ha, alive. What about me, princess? How cold? An older soldier joked. Gray, of course you will be all right, that's why I didn't ask. Should I be happy or sad? Gray, a man who looked about 40 with a stout build, showed no hint of fatigue as he rested his sword on his shoulders. There wasn't any blood on him. If there wasn't any blood on his sword, he had probably been hiding somewhere, which would explain why he still looked so energetic. He was the Knight Grey Co. Aldo, a veteran of the battlefield who rose through the ranks. In Pina's Knight Order, most of the knights were nobles. Since the Knight Order didn't have any real battle experience, such veterans were the real core of the unit. The path to knighthood was narrow for soldiers. However, they would be treated like ordinary officers after they made it through. Hamilton said with a complaining tone, Princess, why are we fighting with the marauders here? It was a bit rude, but she had to say it out loud. It can't be helped. I thought the army from the other world would attack Italica. Don't you all agree? Pina exclaimed. After completing her investigation of the areas around Arnis, Pina heard some news as she was planning to infiltrate Arnis Hill. She came to this decision because she had more information from the enemy who resides in the Arnis Hill. Arnis Hill was a lot closer to the capital than the Dalnus Hill. All that she heard from the surviving soldiers of the second expedition force was horrific tales about horrific undead beings and armored demons what systematically destroyed the army without mercy. So she decided to concentrate one enemy at once. She can't rip herself too after all. That's when she heard the news. A large armed group appeared in Count Formal's territory and is planning to attack Italica. After hearing this, Pina thought the army from the other world had finally started their invasion. Are they sending out forces to suppress the surrounding territories before laying siege to the imperial capital? She thought. She had to take countermeasures then. For Pina, instead of meaningless reconnaissance, an elegant battle suited her better. She pulled out of Arnis, ordered her knights to head for Italica, while she and her group rushed there in advance. No matter what kind of battle it was, not knowing the scale and battle potential of the enemy would be useless. If the enemy forces were limited, she would defend Italica and attack with a pincer attack with her knights that would arrive later. However, she soon realized the ones are attacking Italica were a marauding band. Most of the members were remnants of the former coalition army. In contrast, the head of Clan Formal in charge of the city's defenses was just 11. She couldn't command in battle and morale was at its lowest. Pina was disheartened, but she couldn't stand idle and watch the bandits ravage the city. So, she revealed her identity to the clan and forcefully took over command of the Countess soldiers in defense of Italica. If we can hold for three days, my knights will be here, Pina said. To be honest, they might arrive even later than that. But the citizens and the Countess troops believed in Pina and fought with all they had. The enemy might be the remnants of a defeated army, but they were former soldiers and proficient in attacking fortresses. The city didn't fall, but the gate that was supposed to be solid was destroyed, granting the enemy entry. With the help of the citizens and militia fighting with their farm tools, they survived the first day, but it felt like a defeat. They had lost too much. The small number of troops decreased, and the courageous ones of the militia fell in battle. What remained were casualties and exhausted soldiers. Just one day was enough to plummet the morale of the soldiers and citizens to rock bottom. Pina couldn't think of anything to raise their spirits. That was how her first battle ended. Scene change. JSDF base. Next morning, midway up Arnis Hill, countless wyvern carcasses covered the area. 
According to Kato Sensei, the claws and scales of wyverns could be crafted into tough defensive equipment. Hence, they were valuable items. The children thus harvested them from the decaying carcasses, washed away the rotting meat and blood, and dried them. The third recon division with the lead of Atami sat in their LAVs. In the field, two persons faced with each other while three watched them behind Mammon. The two person who faced each other was the black-clad Lolita demigoddess Rory Mercury and the legendary dark hero. Mammon, Raiden, Tuka, Lele watched them. Itami commanded his squad to stop. He left the LAV and headed towards the little group. Good morning, he waved to the little group. Good morning Itami Kuen, Raiden waved to him. Thanks to the translator items, the others understood what she said and followed her example. They greeted Itami. What's going on here? Asked Itami. Rory Chan challenged Mom and Kuin in a duel. You arrived just in time. They will soon start. Raiden explained. Itami turned towards the two warriors. Seemingly both of them was ready to shed each other blood. The third recon team just watched them from afar in their LAVs. Will they fight with each other? Asked Shino. Oh, two black warriors will fight each other. I need to make a recording from this. So cool, said Karada, as he took out his digital camera what he always kept with himself and focused to the battlefield. What are you doing? We need to stop them, snapped him the short chestnut-haired woman. I think First Lieutenant Itami already stopped them if he felt it. And think about it. How much money can I get for such recording? Two legendary warriors clash in live, explained Karada. Shino gritted her teeth and got out of the car, then headed towards Itami. Meanwhile, Rory and Mamen started their battle. The two of them lunged towards each other, leaving a small crater in their step. Rory used her massive halberd and swung it with a speed what was impossible to follow to a normal human's eyes. Mamen sidestepped from the halberd's path and used his left two-handed sword to strike in Rory's direction. Rory used her halberd to dodge the attack and jumped into the air then followed this up with a downward strike what caused a massive crater on the ground. The battle continued. The two sides became faster and faster. Their strike became more and more reckless after each strike. But seemingly the two of them just can't hit each other. Raiden turned towards Itami, Lele, and Tuka. Well, who wants to bet? She smirked. Tuka and Lele made their bets and offered some wyvern scales from their bags as a bet. Raiden accepted them. The scales of dragons were actually quite valuable. Dragon scales could be divided into several categories. The market value would be dependent on the type and condition of the scales. The highest level would be the scale of dragons. One piece in perfect condition was worth 10 Suwani gold coins. Armor made from the red scales of a flame dragon, very difficult to craft would be a legendary treasure, enough money to buy an entire nation. If it really existed, the next grade would be newborn dragon scales. However, these two types of scales were basically impossible to find in the market. As mentioned earlier, it was impossible for man to hunt dragons. The only way to obtain them was from the skin shed by dragons or newborn dragons during molting. In reality, armor made from dragon scales had made appearances in some tales of heroes and legends, and the item itself was worshipped inside the temple of the god of war. As for wyverns, nations with wyvern riders had a steady supply of them, so these smaller scales were cheaper. One scale was between 30 to 70 silver denarii. If you don't splurge, one silver denarii could feed a person for five days. So, if they sell all 200 scales, Lele's group would be rich. But they needed a suitable buyer for them. Sorry, gambling is forbidden during service duty said Itami as he nervously scratched the back of his head. Don't be like that Itami Kuin. Be a little brave. Don't be grumpy like Mamen Kuin. She puffed her cheeks. Hey, I heard that, said Mamen as he blocked another strike from the smiling Rory. Okay, okay, but I don't really have anything that I can put up. Itami protested. Do you have any currency? Inquired Raiden. Itami glanced at the sidelines. Yes, but I don't think you could buy anything from Yen here. It does not matter. As long as you can put something up, you can play. After all, this is for fun. Itami sighed. Fine. He reached into his pocket and gave Raiden a 1,000 Yen banknote. 
Raiden held towards the sun and inspected it then nodded. Then who do you want to bet? What do you say Raiden-san? Who will win? Inquired Atami. Raiden glanced towards Mamen and Rory. HM. If Mamen Kuin goes all out, he can beat Rory. But if he does not, it will be a draw. Tuka and Lele watched Raiden dumbfounded. They never saw anyone who can beat an apostate beside another apostate. Of course, they did not believe her. So, the two of them waged on the victory of Rory. Kurabayashi reached them. First Lieutenant, sir, you need to stop them. Kurabayashi Chan, good morning. Do you want to bet? Itami Kuin, Lele Chan, and Tuka Chan already made their bets. So, who do you want to bet? Raiden asked cheerfully. Kurabayashi glared to Itami. First Lieutenant, gambling is forbidden under service duty. Don't be like that Shino-chan. Be a little brave, you know. Lady Fortune will not smile you if you are not brave. Itami joked. She gritted her teeth. Then she saw as three more members of the team heading their direction. Raiden turned to them. Ah, so you two came to make your bets. A bet which warrior will win and win the great prize. Bet now. Lady Fortuna will not reward the cowards. The three of them looked at each other. A moment nothing happened. Then Sergeant Major Kuwahara stepped forward and made his bet. I bet on the victory of Mamen Kuin. Then the next. And next member of the third recon team. In the end, the whole third recon team was around the battlefield and cheered for their preferred warrior. Hoping they will win. In the end, Kurabayashi gives up and bet on Mamen. Meanwhile, the fight intensified, and the two warriors' strikes became stronger and stronger faster and faster, creating miniature shockwaves after each of their strikes. The two sides attacked each other relentlessly approximately five minutes time. In the end, Maman surprised Rory with a swift kick in her stomach what make her fly back. Then he jumped on her nailing one of his huge greatsword in her neck. I think I have one, said Maman who stood above Rory. Rory chuckled. You think so? The apostate of Emroy glanced in the groin of Mamen where the end of her halberd nailed. Of course, Mamen could easily defeat Rory. He just held himself back for obvious reasons. Then this is a draw. Rory nodded with a satisfied expression. Mamen helped her up. What? Everyone yelled. Everyone lost the bet except Itami and Raiden who gambled on the match will end with a draw. This is the story how the two of them acquired a vast amount of wealth under a few minutes. After this, the little group headed back to the LAVs and mounted the metal carriages to start their journey towards the town of Italica. Scene change, city of Italica. Before the gates, there was a disturbance at Italica's main gate. Usually, the traffic here would be flowing briskly, and between the merchants and the taxmen they had to deal with, the area would be very lively. However, that bustle was nowhere to be seen today. A pile of wood and furniture blocked the main gate, denying all who would enter. On top of the city wall, which was three stories tall, the sentries were lining up and pointing their crossbows at them. They had even installed a polybolos, which could release multiple bolts in sequence. Also, they had many things that were difficult to imagine as weapons. For instance, there were steaming cauldrons, suspended over fires. If it were located by a river or on a mountaintop, one might think it was a cookpot for a witch. But on top of a city wall, there was no way to believe it was there to prepare food. I hope they don't decide to give us a bath. Karada, who was driving the HMV, muttered those words. Itami thought they couldn't hear you. In variety TV shows, the bath in question was little more than a harmless prop. But in reality, it was a horrible device on par with chemical weapons. Dying from being scalded to death by hot water would be a long and painful way to go. Being scalded by hot water over much of the body would cause the formation of full body blisters and a consequent loss of body fluids, leading to dehydration. If that were not enough to kill a person, the loss of skin would also invite infection. The dead tissues would then rot and lead to sepsis, plunging the victim into terrible pain. Even if they somehow survived, they would bear the scars and agony for life. If he had known that this was not water, but rather molten lead, Itami would have ordered an immediate retreat because he was keenly aware of the stories where people tried to kill themselves by self-immolating. 
but somehow managed to survive after incredible suffering. I don't know. I could use a bath, said Raiden cheerfully. Everyone looked at her with a dumbfounded expression. You know, that is not that kind of bath, do you? Said Kurabayashi while she sweat dropped. Of course I am. Liquid death awaits us under the walls. She laughed. Rory sat between Mamen and Raiden. She looked to Raiden with a lustful eye as she bit her lower lip. Your insanity, your thirst for battle is just, just, I can't get enough of it. Plead yourself to Emroy. Raiden glanced at her with one of her eyes under her hood. The other was closed. Sorry, Rory Chan. I plead to no one. I like to be single. Besides that, your god does not promise any good business opportunities after I die. Mom inside. Please, Raiden. Be quiet for a minute. Does not matter. I will make you two plea yourselves to Emroy. After all, everyone will serve him in death. Sonner or later, said Rory, as she glanced lustfully towards Mammon. Mammon turned his head away. Tuka and Lele just watched this conversation with a dumbfounded expression. The little convoy continued their way towards Italica. A few minutes later, they reached the gates. Italica's defenders used weapons that were quite different from those of Itami and his colleagues. They were sharp or hot, and at a glance, one could call them implements for murder. The term killing intent came up often in TV serials, light novels, or manga, but Itami had never felt that sort of thing during his life in modern society. Perhaps one could only sense these things after becoming a martial arts master. What he could feel right now was a feeling of pain or heat whenever he looked at this stuff. In addition to the caution coming from the defenders, he could feel eyes filled with murderous intent fixed on them. Friend or foe, if you are a friend, then come out, a defender shouted. Although he didn't know the meaning of those words being shouted from above him, he could tell from their tone. He whispered to Lele, doesn't sound like a welcome, should we try another city? They asked friend or foe, explained Mammon. Itami nodded in understanding. The people in the town look very busy too, so it seems like we can't discuss things with them properly. Although I don't know what they'll be fighting against, I don't want to be involved in it. Frankly speaking, my safety and yours are my top priority. What do you think? Yeah, they're dying to have us in there. As Karada grumbled from the passenger seat, Sergeant Major Kuwabara said over the wireless, if they don't move, we don't move. The two of them had their rifles in hand and carefully aimed them outside. However, Lele used her usual blank expression and steady voice to say, Rejected, but we can't get in here while they're like this. There are other entrances. Italica is a plain city. There will be gates on the north, south, east and west. There's no way that there's no other way in. Itami, you wait first. I'll go over there to talk to them. Lele is right. I sat enough. My bottom is numb from the idleness. I say, let's give them a visit. With that, Raiden jumped out the car. Mom inside. Why she is always doing this to me? The black-clad warrior stood up and followed his teammate. With that, Lele wanted to follow them. However, Tuka immediately stopped her and told her to wait. Tuka, like Itami, wanted to know why they had to go to this town. Although she wasn't afraid like Itami was, when one thought about it, there was no benefit to getting involved with a city under siege. There was a chance they might be pulled into the conflict. Well, if they entered the city, they would definitely be involved. Lele replied to her, It's not a question of entering the city, but I want to let them know we're not enemies. If we leave like this, they will think we're part of the enemy forces. If we come back in the future or go to other towns, that news will spread. It'll be inconvenient. However, are you going to pull these people into it because of us? Tuka gestured to Itami, Kiraka, and the others as she spoke. They helped us without asking for repayment. Shouldn't we keep them out of danger? Beside that, Mammon and Raiden are already out here. Mammon is reasonable, but Raiden is a little hot-headed. That's why I'm going. We've received a lot of kindness from Itami and the others, so I don't want them to think that Itami and the rest are enemies. Are you doing this for Itami? Yes. After all, he and the others own this particular riding carriage. Tuka had to nod as she heard this. It'll be okay. 
We'll just say we came to do business and that we're confirming the situation. I understand. However, I can't let you go alone. You need protection from arrows. As Tuka said that, she began chanting a spell in the language of the fairies. Almost immediately, they could feel the motion of the wind. And so, Lele, Tuka, and Rory exited the vehicle. Itami, you should wait here. After repeating that line, the three of them slowly approached the main gate where Raiden and Mammon already waited for them and Raiden just shouted with the defenders of the fortress. The points of the sentry's crossbow bolts tracked them as they approached. As Itami saw this, he felt uneasy even though they had told him to wait. His mind was filled with thoughts like, as a man, as a soldier, as a human being, and so on. All he could do was watch. Though Itami appeared to be frozen in fear, what he felt was actually pride, or something similar. Of course, most adults would not say, it's my honor, but would deceive themselves with words like, the mission or our duty. However, Itami had always been very honest in this aspect, and he quietly said, I hate scary things, but I hate losing face too. After clicking his tongue loudly, he left his Type 64 rifle in the vehicle carefully secured the heavy no. Two bulletproof vest on his body and got out of the HMV. By the way, they were all equipped like the troops in Iraq. He had a pistol strapped to his thigh, but he left his rifle behind because he did not want to appear threatening by carrying a weapon like object. I'm going over too. Frankly speaking, I have to go. Let me go. Nobody's stopping you, are they? After freezing for a few seconds, Itami said, Sergeant Major Kuwabara, I'll leave the rest to you. If anything happens, come over and help. With that, he jogged over to Lele and the others. Pina was forced to make a decision. She had no basis for her decision, but she had to decide anyway. This would be a big gamble. Gray, what should we do? Even the experienced Gray could not answer Pina's question. Nobody could guarantee the outcome, and under these conditions, the need to make a big decision like this turned into an immense source of stress. This was called the Chains of Commanding. The soldiers gripped their weapons, waiting for Pina's decision. The bowmen's hands trembled as they drew their strings taut. The farmers waited with their metal farming implements. The sword-bearing soldiers, the people of Italica, all their lives rested on her decisions. Before the barricaded gate stood a menacingly-looking black-clad warrior with two seemingly masterfully crafted swords on his back. A shorter hooded, masked woman who yelled to let them in. She wore a strange red leather coat what seemingly made from dragon scales and gray armor underneath it. Gray felt despite her short stature she is equally or even more dangerous than the black-clad warrior beside her. A short while they were followed by the apostle of Emroy, Rory Mercury, as well as an elf and a mage actually join a group of bandits. As for why, well, if they had been part of the thieves from the start, they would have taken part in the first attack and Italica would have fallen long ago. However, Rory and the others might not have been with the bandits from the beginning. They might have been waiting for the right time to join in. She could not conclude that they were not part of the bandits just because they did not take part in the first attack. And if they were not part of the bandits, then why had Rory and the others come to Italica? Why had they come to a town under siege? She should just deny them entry, but that might turn them into enemies. Pina wanted Rory and her friends on her side. After all, the townspeople and soldiers would be certain of victory with the Apostle of Emroy, an elf, those two strange armored warriors and a mage on their side. She sensed that she lacked the leadership skills to make her men certain of their victory. Although she wasn't sure why Rory and the others had come, if she could talk them into joining, then she could tell the residents, help is here. No, there was no time for lengthy discussions. She had to make them her allies, either that or forbid them entry. She had two choices. As Pina was thinking of what to do, the sound of knocking came from the outside of the gate. She held her breath. Then, Pina gulped and made a decision. She would use her dignified demeanor to pin down the other party and drag them over to her side. The thrice bolted gate was forcefully and powerfully thrust open. You're here at last, she cheered. After feeling a dull thudding sensation through her hands, Pina saw Rory, the black-clad warrior, his companion, the elf girl, and the mage looking at a man who was collapsed in front of the door. His eyes had rolled up in his head, 
and he had lost consciousness. Immediately, the three of them stared coldly at Pina. Could it be that that was my fault? She muttered in horror. The white-clad mage, the black-clad priestess, the legendary black hero and the blonde, blue-eyed elf nodded as one. But the strange gray exoskeleton wearing female who stood beside the black-clad warrior started to laugh uncontrollably. She just, puff, ha 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 ha. Maman looked to his companion and sighed. Please forgive her. She is like a child. Itami recovered consciousness after a moment. Oh, we, he said as he rubbed his chin while opening his eyes. It was then that he realized the face of Rory, the black-clad priestess, now filled his field of vision. Her black hair grazed across Itami's face. It was a little prickly. Then Itami became aware of the laugh behind him. He looked back, and he saw the still laughing Raiden. Why is she laughing? Asked Itami while he looked at Raiden. Ignore her, Maman said blandly. He heard Sergeant Major Kuwabara trying to reach him and pressed the switch on his lower chest. Lieutenant, are you okay? I was worried. Kind of, yeah. I passed out for a bit. If you had waited any longer, I would have ordered our guys to burst in. Being able to avoid an unnecessary battle was a form of happiness. It would be terrible if they left behind casualties because if this, Kuwabara had waited so long because such thoughts were on his mind. The need to rescue a captured comrade and the need to avoid a needless firefight. It was hard for him to decide which to prioritize. I'll contact you again once I figure out what's going on. Stand by for now. Got it. All right then. Who's going to tell me what's going on? Itami was now addressing the people around him. Rory looked at Tuka. Tuka looked at Lele. Lele looked at Maman. Maman shook his head. Pina looked at the still laughing Raiden for a moment. Then she turned her gaze around pleadingly to everyone around her. In the end, they all looked away, uneasy looks on their faces. Scene change, outskirts of Italica. Beelzebub Golon and his honor guard captain. Creon Carolus rode on their mounts. The mounts under them were their summoned mounts. Beelzebub rode on his demonic Atronach horse that emitted dark aura under its golden armor, and its eyes emitted white fog. This mount created especially for him. It was the result of his father's and aunt's countless hour of summoning experiments. His mount emitted an aura that made every ally around him stronger and demoralized the enemy. Meanwhile, Creon rode on an armored bicorn warlord, a fabulous beast with two horns on its head. The bicorns were in close relationship with the unicorns, just that they had two horns instead of one. And unlike the unicorns whose only the pure and virgin people can mount, the bicorn only tolerated those who already lost their virginity. If a virgin people tried to mount them, they either throw them off themselves or slowly leached away their life essence. They were being escorted with the massive honor guard. Fifty death knights who rode on soul eaters. Fifty Nephilim guard who rode on their similarly armored horses what seemed made from pure ether energy under their black armor. Fifty golden armored honor guard who rode on their various golden armored mounts that were adorned with the symbols of the sorcerer kingdom. On the ground, fifty-five death knights and Nephilim guards and two hundred other golden armored honor guards escorted them. Almost all of them were capable of casting magic minimum of the third tier. Beelzebub sighed. He and his honor guard had left the fortress approximately 15 hours ago. But because of the constantly attacking bandits and stopping multiple times to help the nearby villagers, further increasing the Sorcerer Kingdom fame, they progressed slowly. They could reach Italica more than five hours earlier if his selflessness does not make him protect the weak from those marauders. His father often said to him to consider the situation. Not always worth to make a detour. Still, despite being a demon, he just could not stand to see innocent people suffer. Quite ironic, he often thought. From his thoughts, his friend and captain of the honor guard shook him out. My prince, look, he pointed to the smoking city what was already under siege by the bandits. Which city is that? Asked the first son of Ains. Italica, answered Creon. Beelzebub gritted his teeth. Prepare yourselves. We ride in and save the city. As you wish, my prince, he saluted then relayed the command. Everyone, prepare for battle. 
The cavalry and the infantry units prepared themselves. It seemed all of them moved at once. Every move was synchronized, not just the summoned units. But the golden armored unit's movement happened in a synchronized manner. It seemed the long hours of practice have finally paid off. The battle started, and the honor guard steadily started their march toward the city of Italica. You ask what happened in the battle? Well, dear readers, you will find out next time.